When you break down the T-90 on paper, Russia's most modern battle tank looks pretty fierce. Among other high-tech accessories, it boasts a 125mm smoothbore gun, modular composite armor, and a 1,000-plus horsepower V12 diesel engine. In theory, it offers excellent mobility, protection, and firepower, along with the ability to launch armor-piercing, fin-stabilized, discarding sabot rounds, and anti-tank guided missiles. The T-90 also has several variants and has been a popular export due to its relatively high cost-to-benefit ratio. Then why, you might be wondering, has the T-90 been such an epic failure on the battlefield? To be fair, it's not just the T-90s that are dropping like flies. As Russia's war with Ukraine continues, since February last year, the Russian Armored Corps losses have since reached more than 2,100 tanks. That's around two-thirds of the tanks Russia initially rolled out of Moscow on their way to Kyiv. Russia has lost so many tanks, in fact, that they've had to reactivate and deploy hundreds of older models, including the T-72 Ural, T-62, and T-5455, some of which are 50, 60, even 70 years old. And most of these have headed to the front without any meaningful upgrades, not since the collapse of the Soviet Union anyway, to their optics, fire control systems, or armor. It probably wasn't the first choice, one could imagine, of the boys back at the Kremlin to roll out these older models. This decision likely has something to do with the recent spike in losses of their prized T-90s. In total, Russian troops have been forced to scrap or abandon nearly 60 of these 53-ton, three-person tanks, roughly 15% of Russia's pre-war inventory, with most being lost in only the last few months. But wait, aren't these supposed to be the baddest tanks around? That's certainly what the Kremlin's been saying. Before we get to the specific factors contributing to the T-90's proposed survivability, or lack thereof, let's take a moment to address one other important point. When we zoom out, there's an argument to be made that the increasing number of T-90's being destroyed on the battlefield in Ukraine might actually be a negative sign of things to come for our friends in Kyiv. How's that? Well, let's look at it like this. One reason that so many T-90s have been destroyed recently, but certainly not the only reason, is that there's been more of them deployed to destroy. Translation, Russia's current production of T-90s has been picking up, as Putin's nearly two-year effort to boost tank production finally seems to be paying off. Apparently, Russia has been able to work around some of its increasingly tighter foreign sanctions, including those on critical high-end electronics that it was once importing from France. As mentioned before, the number of destroyed or captured T-90s accounts for roughly a quarter of Russia's pre-war inventory. This overall number, however, does not include the hundreds that have been produced by the Ural Vagonzavod plant in Svedlovsk Oblast since the start of 2022. Russia's increased productivity could become a serious problem for Ukraine, considering its main tank plant, the Malyshev factory in Kharkiv, currently lacks the capacity to produce new tanks from scratch and is limited to performing upgrades and repairs. This leaves Ukraine's armored forces mostly reliant on foreign donations if they intend to deploy a fleet of modern Western-style tanks, which they have, including German Leopard 2s, British Challenger 2s, and the American M1 Abrams. But are foreign donations going to be able to match Russian tank production? Well, it's hard to say, but it probably wouldn't hurt for Ukraine's Western allies to throw in a few more tanks especially because the Ural Vagonzavod plant can, hypothetically, produce enough new T-90s in the next six months to match Ukraine's current inventory of comparable, modern battle tanks. But even if this theory is true, and an increasing number of T-90s are being destroyed largely because more are being manufactured and deployed, that certainly isn't the whole story. The overall effectiveness and functionality of the T-90 has been a matter of debate since the beginning, with many distinguished experts expertly concluding that, overall, the T-90 is a piece of junk. First introduced as the T-72BU, then renamed the T-90 to distinguish it from all the other T-72 variants, the T-90 was thought to be one of the most well-protected tanks in the world, while also boasting one of the most heavily equipped battle systems currently on the market. After being officially brought into service in 1992, the T-90 has received a number of upgrades and subsequent name changes. In 2004, it was renamed the T-90A, and then in 2016, it was upgraded and rebranded again as the T-90M. Then, after its most recent upgrade in 2017, it came to be called the T-90MS. There were also less popular variants along the way, but those aren't worth mentioning here. 
Since its conception, one of the major selling points of the T90 has been its relatively low cost. Save for the most recent variant, the T90MS, which runs closer to $4 million, the full line of older, less expensive T90 models can still be purchased and exported for around $3 million. Even though it continues to be produced primarily for use by the Russian Army's armored division, the Kremlin has sold and exported thousands of T90s, mostly T90S variants, to countries such as Algeria, Armenia, and Iraq. In fact, India alone is now in possession of more than 2,000 Russian-built T90Ss. Underneath the hood, so to speak, of all currently available T90 variants is a V12 diesel engine. The most powerful, coming in at 1,130 horsepower, can be found on the T90MS. The T90 is also about 20 tons lighter than the M1 Abrams, and was designed to accommodate and be operated by, thanks to its auto-loading firing system, just a three-man crew. Upon closer inspection, however, the effectiveness of both the engine and loading system have come into question, but more on that a bit later. So what about firepower? Well, if the T90 has one thing going for it, it definitely has a lot of that. The T90's 2A46M4 125mm smoothbore main gun can fire a range of high-tech ammunition options, including armor-piercing, fin-stabilized discarding sabot rounds, as well as the anti-tank guided missiles mentioned earlier, also known as the 9M119 Reflex, or by NATO as the AT-11 Sniper. These high-tech projectiles have a maximum range of 4,000 meters, with a flight time of 11.7 seconds, and can, under certain conditions, even take down helicopters. Also in terms of firepower, the T-90 features two externally mounted machine guns. One is a 12.7mm cord heavy machine gun that has a cycle rate of fire of 700 to 800 rounds per minute and can be remotely operated from within the tank. The other is a PKMT 7.62mm coaxial machine gun. And when it comes to protection, in addition to conventional armor plating, modern T-90 variants also come equipped with two very high-tech defensive systems. The first is the Shatora-1, an active protection system made by the Russian company Electronic Torg that includes a 360-degree laser warning receiver complete with automatically triggered countermeasures that deploy if the tank is painted by an enemy laser. This device can even orient the tank's main gun in the direction of the laser's origin. The Shatora-1, among other features, also comes with an infrared jammer and a grenade launching system that has the capacity to discharge smoke grenades which release an infrared obscuring aerosol cloud. The modern T-90's second line of defense is its Contact 5 Explosive Reactive Armor, or ERA, which is essentially a layer of high explosive sandwiched between two metal plates designed to minimize the damage of explosive projectiles by detonating just prior to their impact. Pretty fancy, right? ERA was specifically designed to counter a range of advanced weaponry, including missiles and rockets carrying high explosive anti-tank warheads as well as highly deadly sabot rounds, which separate after being fired and turn into a thin, fin-stabilized rod made of depleted uranium. Once a sabot round impacts an enemy tank, the kinetic force it creates while penetrating also creates a steam of molten metal that pours into the cabin with it. This instantaneously increases the temperature and pressure inside of the sealed turret, killing or rather cooking everyone inside. The T-90 also comes with a magnetic mine detection system that when functioning properly uses an electromagnetic pulse to disable mines before the tank can run over them. So then what's the deal, you might be asking? Why aren't these extra fancy protection systems making the T-90s unstoppable? For one, these systems haven't performed so well against long-range anti-tank guided missiles. There was one report that stated a Ukrainian took out two T-90Ms back-to-back -back using an AT-4 anti-tank weapon. If that report is accurate, this would be a very impressive set of skills. The Swedish-made Saab AT-4, given to the Ukrainians by the US and Sweden, is a lightweight, shoulder-launched anti-armor weapon. However, despite delivering an 84mm projectile out to a range of 300 meters, this unguided weapon should not be effective against a T-90M's reactive armor, which the manufacturers claim is effective against not just low-speed rockets and missiles, but also tank rounds coming in at hypersonic speeds. There are, it seems, even more embarrassing ways to lose a tank, which Russia has also discovered recently. Apparently, a group of Russian technicians accidentally set fire to a T-72 they were attempting to repair. In the confusion, the ammunition on board caught fire and exploded, completely destroying the tank 
and damaging two others nearby. The loss of this tank and the two T-90Ms suggest that a more complex set of problems might be plaguing the Russian military. And this makes the actual durability and effectiveness of the T-90 more difficult to determine. Is the hyped T-90M any less vulnerable than earlier models? It's hard to tell when it's regularly being used without proper tactical or common sense. Another reason the T-90 was poorly conceived compared to other main battle tanks is that its underlying design is outdated. Ultimately, as we mentioned before, the T-90 is simply an improved version of the T-72. Essentially, the turret of the T-80 and the hull and drivetrain of the T-72 combined together and covered over with reactive armor. And because the T-90 is in its essence only an update, it retains all of the defects of its bargain-built older brothers. Its inherent shortcomings leading to the apparent failure of the T-90's ultra-modern defensive systems is one thing, but this tank has also been the victim of tactical incompetence and has regularly been rolled into impossible, no-win situations. In modern warfare, advancing tanks are supposed to be supported by infantry for the very purpose of suppressing enemy ground troops who might be using anti-tank weapons, like the AT-4. Deployed armor should also have artillery support, if only to help mitigate any long-range threats. Sending tanks forward without defensive support, as Russia has continued to do in Ukraine, makes them extremely vulnerable, especially to infantry units using shoulder-launched weapons. Mobile ground units, when allowed to get in close, can carry out ambushes at short range, which allows them to focus their attacks on a tank's more vulnerable target areas. A particularly vulnerable area for these tanks that's also been exposed by the creative fighting tactics being used in Ukraine is the roof. So it seems the T-90 has had some trouble with the anti-tank missiles that are fired from elevated positions and ultimately come down onto these vehicles from above. The T-90's 360-degree active protection system is supposed to protect from this sort of attack, and its failure to do so might suggest that this fancy new system isn't as infallible as first advertised. A range of other deficiencies came to light after the first T-90 was captured, intact, from the battlefield in Ukraine. With the tank now safely in their possession, military specialists from the Ukrainian Center for the Study of Captured and Prospective Weapons and Military Equipment were able to conduct an analysis of all internal equipment and armaments and went on to publicly announce their findings in March of 2023. When, around the same time, another T-90A was captured, this one was apparently handed over to the US, also for the purpose of research. But when one of Russia's most modern pieces of armor was spotted on a trailer in Louisiana, then subsequently photographed, a debate surrounding the tank's unlikely appearance on American soil exploded on social media. It isn't fully known what the US ultimately had planned for the tank, but we do know what Ukraine did with theirs. They ripped it apart, literally and figuratively. Once the team of Ukrainian experts had completed their investigation, they claimed to have uncovered little more than an old T-72 hiding beneath the shell of widespread Russian propaganda, labeling Russia's new war machine an overall failure and not nearly the breakthrough the Kremlin had been all along claiming it to be. The team of engineers from the Center for the Study of Captured and Prospective Weapons and Military Equipment also noted that the well-praised automatic loader was largely the same design as could be found on the older T-72, the only major difference being that the ammo was now stored in a separate compartment outside the turret. This modification, however, created the complication of tankers having to fully exit the vehicle in order to load ammunition into the main compartment, which, to be done with any practical sense or relative amount of safety, would require that the tank leave the field of battle talk about taking yourself out of the fight. The center also reportedly discovered significant limitations concerning the T-90's B92S2F V12 diesel engine, which Ukrainian engineers claimed did not have sufficient power to reliably propel the vehicle, a claim that was supported by videos of T-90s getting stuck in the mud. They also noted that the highly praised Kalina computerized fire control system had incorporated in its design not only civilian electronic components, but some of Western origin. While other electronic components had been assembled without adhering to moisture control requirements, resulting in increased oxidation, shortened lifespan, and unexpected failure. But the embarrassment of Russian tank builders isn't the Kremlin's biggest problem here. If Ukraine persists in revealing the secrets and vulnerabilities of the allegedly advanced systems and technologies of the T-90, 
This could potentially create a serious financial challenge for Russia in the future, by giving other countries the information needed to produce their own, while simultaneously diminishing the hype surrounding the Russian-made T-90, sales are bound to diminish. And this is no small sum we're talking about. Russia has currently received a combined total of nearly $10 billion for exported T-90s from India and Algeria alone. But a fair amount of damage seems to have already been done. As reports of the T-90s mediocrity have continued to surface, many foreign companies that had previously signed contracts with Russia have swiftly cancelled those agreements. All these technological and mechanical shortcomings, though, are only part of the bigger story. The lack of success the T-90 has had on the battlefield in Ukraine cannot be truly understood without looking at the opposition they faced. It would be a disservice to Ukraine's ferocious troops to do otherwise. Combined with grit and determination born largely of national pride, Ukrainian forces have also received an impressive amount of anti-tank weaponry from the US as well as other allies. From the US alone, Ukraine has received more than 10,000 Javelin anti-armor systems, 90,000 other anti-armor systems and munitions, 8,000 tube-launched, optically-tracked, wire-guided Tau missiles, 35,000 grenade launchers and small arms, 4 million rounds of small arms ammunition and grenades, and a whole slew of laser-guided rocket systems, rocket launchers, and anti-tank mines. According to Washington's regularly updated list of wartime contributions, which includes 31 Abrams tanks, 45 T-72B tanks, 186 Bradley infantry fighting vehicles, 20 Mi-17 helicopters, dozens of combat drones, lots of state-of-the-art satellite communications equipment, and more than 100,000 sets of body armor and helmets, President Biden has provided nearly $44 billion in military assistance to Ukraine thus far. Weapons are a critical part of warfare, that's obvious, but without resourcefulness, they will only take a conventional force so far. Which makes the new tactic Ukrainian forces have been using against Russian tanks that much more impressive. To go along with their already proven yet more traditional ambush maneuvers, they've also developed a highly creative yet simple way of utilizing landmines. Essentially, as a Russian mine plow clears a path through a known minefield, Ukrainian troops will wait for it to pass, then toss fresh mines onto the same path right in front and sometimes behind the trailing convoy, effectively littering the cleared corridor with new mines. The vehicles following the mine plow end up hitting these mines or run over the mines as they try to escape the trap. To execute this brazen new maneuver, the Ukrainians have been utilizing two different types of mines. One is the Soviet TM-62, the other is the American Remote Anti-Armor Mine System, or RAM, of which the US has donated more than 30,000. The 21-pound TM-62 is what you think of when you think of a traditional mine, basically a big metal disc packed with explosives and fitted with some sort of fuse. The RAM, on the other hand, is slightly different and consists of nine mines that are four pounds each stacked together in a hollow 155mm artillery shell. With practice, Ukrainian troops have found that a few well-aimed volleys can scatter scores of these, each with a magnetic fuse, across a relatively wide area. This tactic has been a big success recently, as armored vehicles have continued to roll in neat lines across the fields and forests between the Russian-occupied cities of Pavlivka and Volodar. And what often happens, after the lead tank hits a mine and explodes, the rest of the column attempts to scatter. Some vehicles try to go around the wrecked lead vehicle, only to hit a mine themselves. In these scenarios, even retreat is dangerous, as there might be fresh mines now scattered behind the column, littered across the very path it used to come through. In the past weeks, in the region surrounding Volodar, the Russians have lost 30 or more armored vehicles, including a few tanks, and it seems that well-placed mines have largely been the cause. To defeat these tactics and save a few of their prized T-90s, Russia will need, at minimum, better intelligence and a more flexible command and control strategy. In theory, the narrow TM-62 minefields shouldn't be that hard to avoid if the opposing force was able to, let's say, organize 24-hour surveillance and a reliable means of disseminating information to its frontline forces. And Russia will need exactly that if they want to keep ahead of Ukraine's clearly savvy military engineers. But what do you think? Have the technical shortcomings of the Russian T-90 been the primary cause of its poor performance? Or are these tanks being utilized poorly and judged unfairly? 
Also, how might foreign military aid and Ukraine's improvised tactics be contributing to the loss of so many Russian tanks? Let us know in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe for more military analysis from military experts.